Welcome to Barbell Business. I'm Mike Bledsoe here with Doug Larson, Marcus Kersey, and our special guest, Jessica Webster. Hey. <laughs> Welcome back. Hey. We, we flew Thanks. in from- I'm uh, nervous now. Flew in from Canada. Sunny Canada. First class. <laughs> first class? Jeez. I don't even fly first class. What's going on here? <laughs> I've never flown first class. I've been bumped. I've been bumped the first class. I didn't, oh, really? I've never got bought the upgrade. Ticket. Oh, I've gotten an upgrade a couple times. Yeah, it spoils you. You're like, oh, I bet it does. I should be buying this. Jessica's I fancy. Every time. She, that's yeah. all she does now. She's well, just all over the map. Those are the, the perks map. of like being best friends with the person who schedules the flights. Your wife. Woo. <laughs> 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 Worked out great. Uh, yeah, today we're doing a live Q and A. And uh, is this our first one we've ever done? This is the first time we've done a live Facebook. Live show Q&A, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, people have, you have submitted your questions uh, via Instagram and Facebook, and we have collected them. And if you're watching live, you can interact in real time and ask your questions, and we are going to give you the right answer. Every time. The, the one single available right answer. Yeah. Exactly. The, the single truth that exists <laughs> for each one of us. <laughs> yeah. so I feel like this is a very somber day. Everyone's wearing black except for Doug for some reason. <laughs> it's, a, it's a black. It's cloudy it outside. Is. It's, it's, is it cloudy? Are you joking? Tell. Today is a very special day in California history. We're oh, supposed yeah. to have the most rain ever recorded in like a, whatever, a five or six hour period in the last, I think it's the most recorded ever for California okay. and in like within 20 years, we're getting it in five hours. So it's going to be five to seven inches of rain in like... Oh, that would explain why. Hours. It's wow. a, we've got a big storm coming in like an hour. That's why Sweet. You guys flew me out for this? Out. That, that would yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> yeah. Hey. Welcome back. <laughs> if you go to the grocery store, all the food's gone. They've all freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> There's water <Right>. coming! <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. All right, what's the first question? What do we have here? <clears throat> All right, so let's start off with, um, let's see here. So we've got from uh, Chris Tig. Um, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Tig. Tig. Um, so it says, uh, other than Barbell Logic, what are other marketing strategies that a gym should consider? How should a gym uh, set aside, or how much, sorry, should a gym set aside for marketing each month uh, to include the cost of Logic? Okay, so kind of a couple things in here. So I read that as, you know, what, what are all the different things a gym should be considering to market their gym? And I think that, um, you know, for most, they think marketing, they think uh, it's about running ads. It's about the advertising aspect of it. But really what we've learned um, with the affiliates we've worked with is it's really about starting from the inside out. So it's the internal marketing that has to happen first rather than what's necessarily just happening externally constantly. So usually that means, okay, well, let's start by making sure that we are internally highlighting the, the members making them feel special. There's a culture there. There's social activities happening regularly. You get into a regular groove of, you know, demonstrating value between the the facility itself progressing, the training programs themselves progressing, the uh, social events and fun activities that you're doing and that you're documenting all of this stuff. And it's part of your newsletter strategy. If you don't have a monthly newsletter, you're missing the boat. Make sure you're putting something together that talks about, here's all the awesome stuff that happened last month. Here's the awesome stuff that's happening right now that you should know about. And here's the things that are coming up. And and being able to tie in all the things that you're doing within your gym, especially all the wins for your members. So new members that you've brought on board, welcome them to the family. Hey, you know, uh, Scott set a, a goal to add these these 20 pounds to his snatch in the next six months and he crushed it on one of our individualized programs. Like highlight people from the inside out first and then take that content, distribute it out through your social media channels so we can get the inside buzzing. And doing that is kind of like the core is gonna make people feel really awesome. Now you have the, the ammunition to get lots of good testimonials and get great video content that you can now start to share outwards on these channels, put on your websites and so on. And then now you have that content, you can chop that up and start running ads using those tools mm. is what I would say. Yeah, the, uh, I, I would say by priority, the first thing you should have if you're, is a referral program. If you don't have a referral program in place, that's your number one thing to do now. I wouldn't do any other marketing until you have that. And the second th piece is testimonials. So those are going to be your most powerful pieces of marketing. Uh, and if you don't have testimo video testimonials on your website and you don't have a referral program in place, those, those are the first two things you should be doing before you get in the weeds of doing Facebook ads or anything like that. I mean, you said website, like automatically assuming that everyone already has a killer kick-ass website. Like if your website's, you know, two or three or four years old, you, you might need an upgrade. You know, a lot of people, they kind of like you said, 
they don't think that they do any marketing, but they have a website and they have a Facebook page and they have signage out front and they and they do social events. Like they do all these things that let other people know about their gym and, and what their gym is all about. Th- those are all marketing in some way or another, even if it's not paid media, like I spent $500 on ads this month, like it's really easy to attribute those dollars to marketing. But if you have a Facebook page and you're doing Facebook posts and you're paying a coach to do those Facebook posts, well, that coach is helping you with your marketing, even if it's organic and that person has a salary. And so you really should be contributing some percentage of that coach's income or not income, that coach's salary toward, towards some type of marketing spend. So, you know, whether you like it or not, you're spending some money on marketing and, and the, the percentage I've always considered to be kind of a standard easy percentage that you should be spending on marketing is right around 10%. Whatever 10% of your revenue is should go back into um, to marketing your company um, in one way or another. And again, it doesn't have to be Facebook ads. It could be, you know, it could be putting extra signage like scattered around like the, the three mile radius of your gym, which is really easy kind of um, like guerrilla marketing. But 10% of your revenue should be going back into marketing one way or another. Yeah, we, we actually ended up getting up. We started at 10% with active. And there was a point where we got up to almost 30% that we were putting towards it. Because when you really think about like what drives the whole business, it's about the social activities and the parties you're throwing. And we're, we're all going to go bowling and we're going to, you know, put a, um, you know, we're going to provide the lanes for the night. Or you're going to, we're going to put on this great, you know, Barbells for Boobs event. We're going to get the food trucks out. We're going to contribute and match dollars. Like these are all marketing spends where you realize that the, the, what you're getting back in and, you know, first of all, it locks in. You People have retention issues. Start there. Start by, like, getting the, the core healthy and, and keeping people excited about what they're a part of. And then everything kind of contributes to that. And as, once you're healthy, you can start to turn that up. And the, the return on that is huge. What do you see with that, Jess? Uh, well, Doug had mentioned something about having a coach on social media. Um, I think that a good social media hack is to make sure that your gym is Instagrammable. So if you can go to like a place online and order a mural, like easy walls, um, I'm ordering some of these things for my co-working space. They have some really cool urban sort of scapes for just a couple hundred bucks. And that's something that I'm putting on my stage so that anytime there's a speaker or a band or something, it just looks like a really cool kind of expensive place to be. And um, if you know anything about Facebook marketing these days, uh, putting anything on your business page it's hard to get a lot of organic traffic that way unless it's being shared or interacted with or you're putting money towards it. And so having your own members share content on their personal sites or your own personal uh, pages, personal meaning like your personal Facebook pages, that's really the way to get a lot of organic um, reach in a way that you don't have to pay for anything. So yeah, make it easy to take pictures. Like I would even suggest, you know, having those little, um, like that thing over there, you know, the thing that holds onto your iPhone that you can strap around uh, a weight or whatever, or like your iPhone your strap rig. on. iPhone strap on. <laughs> yeah. Easy. Easy. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, have a couple of those just to make it easy for people to um, record themselves. Even, and to share even it. Hunter's shaking his head. <laughs> <laughs> Too far. Oh, I miss strap you guys. On. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, we can't take anything seriously. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, great, great points. Um, all right, so next question, Mike. You want to take question? Pick one out. Uh, oh, this is a good one. How does a box owner determine membership fees? Who wants to take it? Don't you have a worksheet for something like that? You had like an equation, right? <laughs> I think we do. <laughs> Is that downloadable anywhere? Not. Mm. No, that was part of the, the workshop. I think that we, we should did. make that downloadable. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I like to start with figuring out how much money you need to make and, and reverse engineering the whole deal. Um, there was a point where we were charging at Faction, I think it was about $125 a month at the time. Mm-hmm. And then we... We were tired of, we're like, oh, we're, we're doing all the things that we plan to do and the money that we want to make still isn't here. You know, we really need to sit down and reverse engineer this thing. How much money do we really need to be making each year for the owners to get paid what they want to get paid, uh, have the coaches get paid what they want to get paid? And this is what's interesting too is you go, oh, you know, if we have 200 members, it's easy to forget that you're going to need five coaches on staff to manage, you know, 200, 250 members and how much are they actually going to get paid? What's your health insurance going to cost? There's a lot of these costs that are built in. I think a lot of times people get, they're like, oh, when I have 150 members paying 125 bucks a month, that, that looks like a lot of money. For sure, that'll just cover the cost. Mm-hmm. But it, it's easy for us to not actually dig into what is actually, what things are actually going to cost. And so what we did was we 
add it all up. What do we want to make as owners? What do we want to be able to pay our coaches? Uh, if we need to move facilities, how much is that going to cost per month for that and rent? We want to have brand new equipment all the time. You don't want your equipment to get more than you know two or three years old. We're going to have to replace it. Okay, we need at least – we always had a 10 or 15% of the of our revenue coming in to get, recycle back into getting uh, new equipment, putting paint on the walls, things like that. And I think a lot of gym owners are like, oh, if I could just make ten or fifteen thousand dollars a month, I'll be happy. And then you get to that point and you realize that that doesn't hardly cover anything. Mm -hmm. So I think we came up with I think it was four hundred and eighty six thousand um, dollars mm -hmm. is what that we wanted the gym to make per year, just like bare minimum. And then we go, okay, if we have X amount of members, what does that come out to? And we basically were like, oh, we need to be charging about 200 bucks a month per member. Mm -hmm. And it was going through the practice of reverse engineering. The pricing was extremely valuable because it hit me in a way that if I can't ask people for this much money and get them to sign up, I don't even want to be in the business. I have no business running a gym if I can't ask for people for that much money. So because... I don't want to, I don't want five years to go by and I still am just miserable trying to pay bills, just breaking even. That's not fun at all. Nobody should do that. Well, and the side effect is, is that you're going to burn out, right? Yeah. So now the whole reason for you starting your gym and you dedicating your life to this thing is going to go down the toilet because you didn't figure out how to actually make it sustainable for yourself and your team. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's fully about reverse engineering. And the way I always looked at it was like, okay, well, what, first of all, who do I want to serve? How do I, how can I serve them best? What's it going to take for me to crush it for the people that I, I want to serve, right? So what's kind of my strength? How am I going to be able to do that well? What's it going to take from a staffing standpoint to get that done without me? So like none, no free work, nothing that I'm oh, just going to be doing. That's a good point. Right? So everything yeah. is accounted for. So if I choose to take a job within my own company, I can. And so what's it going to take to get to those different milestones, right? So what does the business look like at 50 members? What's it going to look like at 100 members? What's it going to look at 150? And the other consideration is to then say, okay, well, what kind of business do I want to run? Because people just think, okay, well, if I just want to make the money I want to make, it's real easy to get caught up in like, oh, well, it looks like I need like 983 members to make that income, right? Because they don't look at the average client value. And the average client value is really the trick because I want my quality of life to actually be appropriate. So one of the experiences we had with Active was we, when we initially opened, we thought our goal was to get to like 300 to 400 members. That was like the vision. So we did everything accordingly. We grew, 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 grew. And we got to a point where we were almost at 300 members. And Scott and I looked at each other and we're like, dude, I fucking hate this. Like, I don't like this volume because the whole thing I liked most about it was the relationship and the community aspect and everything over like, 175 to 200, I got lost in the weeds and I pride myself in being like good at being able to keep up with this. And we're like looking at classes, I'd show up and I'm like, I don't know, you, 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 you. And, I, and they're like, yeah, I've been here for three months. And I'm like, that's not good. Yeah. Right. So we basically said, okay, well, what, where, where did we like it best? What kind of business did we want to run? So if I want to only serve 175 or 200 people, now at that, I know what my fixed number is. Now, how do I get to the income goal that I want? How do I have the staff to do my job so I can actually take a vacation, not be part of it if I don't want to be a part of it and still get an owner's override for just running the business? And like, there's kind of these multiple layers mm -hmm. that we'll go through. And we go through this money mapping exercise with the people coming on with Logic because it's so important to understand these numbers. It's not just how many members do you want, how many members at what average client value, how does that average client value break down between recurring memberships, one-time sales, retail, all that. What do I want out of this thing just as an owner for putting my ass on the line to even open this thing and the quality of life associated with it? I have a question for you guys. So let's say that there are people out there who are just starting their gyms and they're kind of doing like the bare minimum gym. Mm -hmm. um, would you suggest charging sort of a lower membership fee and then raising it as your experience improves or starting at like your the, the number that you want to have as like your membership for a while? and then improving the um, gym experience as you go. I, th I think that depends on your like financial situation. If you're in a position where you're, you're, let's say you're, you know, you use your own cash to do it. You're able to, you know, get by for the next six months and you don't have to pull a salary and you can grow more slowly then do it right. I mean, charge exactly what you want to charge and maybe do some sort of incentives at first to kind of get the show rolling. But for most people, they start off and they're like, dude, I have to get to this break even number to pay my rent, pay my, like, keep this thing alive. And I've got like three months to do it. In that position, I find myself to say, okay, well, what do I know 
how do I know I'm going to be able to get to that number in recurring revenue? Not with like high-end PT front-end sales. That may be my vision long-term mm -hmm. because that's the kind of business I want to really build. But I need to get to like 45 members at, you know, at let's say 125 bucks a month like tomorrow. So how can I do the same quality service and just get to that number as quickly as possible so the stress is off, bills are paid, people are on contracts, I'm good to go, and now I can start to say, okay, great, I'm going to start to ratchet that up because I don't need to grow as quickly. Now I'm comfortable. I know I can pay my bills. I can eat. And now I can start to move it a little bit forward. But that first like 90 to 180 days is usually pretty crucial for most because usually you borrowed money and you're going to open with zero income and your rent starts mm -hmm. maybe on month one, maybe on month three, depends on what you negotiated. Yeah, and ideally you're doing some type of, of a pre-sale in that case yep. where if you're going to give some type of discount rate where you think your, your rate should be 200 bucks a month and you want to do something ridiculous like 125 or, or 150, you give them, give them 25% off or more mm -hmm. and, and you're doing some type of a pre-sale, that gives you a lot of money up front. That way you don't have to worry so much right when the doors open if anyone's going to show up because no one wants to show up to a gym and walk in and like, I'm here for class. And two no people. One, no one's there. Right. Like you're the only person. Maybe there's one other person. Like it mm -hmm. just it just feels dead because it is dead. Yeah. Like if you if you do the pre-sale, you get some money on the front end, and then when people come to their first class, they have a good experience because there's already people there. Especially like if it's like opening day. Ideally, everybody shows up and they're like, "Wow, this place is going to be legit because look at all these people." Mm -hmm. And then everyone keeps coming back because they had that good first day experience. So I think a pre-sale is key, and then having bumps every maybe 50 members. You know, 50, 100, 150, and especially around the 150 mark, you can, if you want to cap it, like you were saying, like if you don't really want to go much beyond 150, not because you're not trying to make more money, but because like you just don't want the the lifestyle or the stress change that comes with going beyond 150, 175, 200, where you start not to know your members and it feels more like like work because it's not fun anymore because you don't know everybody and it's not like you're just, you're not hanging out anymore now you're yep. now you're training people which is which is subtly different so if you can get to that 150 175 number well now at that point you can make some type of what you might consider to be like an absurd rate now it's 300 bucks you know mm -hmm. monthly for your membership and and or you have to pay we only do your your contracts up front we don't even do month to month charges anymore you, you pay paid in full for a whole year, it's three thousand dollars or whatever you want it to be, and that's how that's how you cap your membership without capping your membership. Awesome. Boom. All right, let's go for uh, another question here. Um, uh, let me see here. Talked about this one here. Oh, all right, from Daniel Rios. What's going on, Daniel? Yeah, Daniel. Um, just about an hour south of us here, or forty-five minutes or so. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Real so Beach. it says. In the, uh, in the seminar, you guys talked about numbers that we should be tracking. What specific numbers do you guys track when you're running your gyms? Well, um, there's a lot. <laughs> but, um, you know, you're, it depends on how granular you want to get. But for me, I tend to put a lot of emphasis around, like, the, the intake process and pipeline and making sure you're really staying accountable for every single step along the way so you can really address all the aspects of your conversion. So start with website visits to how many people, you know, downloaded one of your lead magnets to how many people filled out your primary call to action to how many of those people did you actually get on the phone to do your call to how many people did you actually get scheduled and how many people actually showed up to your thing? If they showed up, how many said yes? How many said maybe? How many said no? Okay. When they came on, what's your like 30 day, 60 day, 90 day and on like how, where are people falling off so that you can look at the whole thing as it, from a data perspective and say, cool, good, 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 good. Whoa, everyone drops off right there. And you can now zoom in and to and address that specific thing rather than you have three big number points or four big number points where now you you might have like the big picture. Like if you're talking about the health of a business, you can look at those, you know, total revenue, average client value and and just overall average duration of membership. And because you can look at average client value as just like as, on a monthly basis or total. But I tend to like to see all the, those numbers. I literally every step in your process, put a little flag in the, in, uh, in the water and say, okay, I want to mark how many people are passing that and track it that way. And same thing if you do any initiative like a referral program, right? We put this out in front of people and how many people looked at it, how many people opted in for it, how many people then followed through on it and how many people did it again. You can say, okay, did that work that well? And now I can refine it. And I just apply every step. You just put a marker in there for everything that you do with your with your campaigns mm -hmm. yeah yeah so you certainly have marketing metrics and, and funnel metrics that's that's something you, you definitely need to do as a gym owner mm -hmm. uh, then you have all of your your 
not necessarily marketing metrics, but you're just your membership metrics. Mm-hmm. You know, how many people did you sign up this month? How many people left? How many people mm-hmm. uh, are on, on hold? Like you froze their account because they're injured or they're out of town or, or whatever happens to be. Um, you know, how many people did, did you re-sign? Like mm-hmm. how many people did their membership lapse and then they re sign back up? Uh, those types of metrics are really important. Financial metrics are certainly important. You know, how much money did you make? How much money did you spend? How much how much profit did you get? How many t-shirts did you sell? Like, do you have all those things broken up where you know membership was you know eighty five percent of my revenue and t-shirts were seven and a half percent and seminars were the rest of it or what have you? That way you know where your money's coming from. That way you know where to put your emphasis. Of course, if you run a gym, membership's easily going to be your your number one. But uh, you know where else are you making money? We 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 discovered at our gym. You know, with all the other things we were selling, seminars and, and workshops, like weightlifting, eight-week weightlifting workshop or doing a nutrition seminar or, or some type of presentation, people pay a one-time fee for it. Maybe our members come for 25 bucks and then outside people come for 200 bucks or something like that. Those things were the most profitable things outside of membership, like supplements and t-shirts and all, all those other things. They, they also made money, but the cost of goods sold associated with them made it where actual, actual profitability really didn't wasn't that big of a deal compared to workshops that someone might, might pay, you know, 400 bucks for uh, an eight week weightlifting workshop that's four or 500 bucks um, or a nutrition seminar that's, you know, hundred bucks, 200 bucks, things like that. Those things were much more profitable because they're, there's no cost of goods sold associated with them. Just a coach says, oh yeah, I'll do that presentation. And they make a PowerPoint and, and they present for two hours and people pay money for it. So you got to know where your money's coming from. For sure. Mm-hmm. For sure. And this is um, addressing, by the way, also from uh, Colin Farrell from Potomac CrossFit. Um, he, cause he was saying data, tra- he, we do a ton of data tracking for our affiliate almost to the point where the amount of it can be overwhelming. Are there any specific data points, maybe two or three that you guys would recommend? No, <laughs> I wouldn't say just two or three, because it's like you said, there's just in membership alone in your funnel, in your, your marketing metrics, there's, yeah. there's a, a large spectrum and you could say maybe in each category, there can be a few like key points, like how many members did I gain? How many did I lose? Mm-hmm. <laughs> be a good place to start. Well, yeah. Well, I'll ask this. If there's only – say I'm not tracking any data whatsoever, what's the first three things you start tracking? I'd, I'd say income and expenses and then members lost, members gained. Yep. That like, was so four. Those are, those are easily the two. Or, I gave or them it, could one be, mine. it could be five. five. It could <laughs> be is that three, four, or five. Or maybe it's just two. I, I'd, say, I'd say it's six <laughs> because it, it's, it's, it's revenue, expenses, and profitability, and then it, it's, it's – uh, members gain, members loss, and then whatever your net is. Yeah. See, I was wrong no matter what. <laughs> I wonder how Colin is tracking his stuff because if your metrics are overwhelming, then it might be because you're Frankensteining them together and putting them on a spreadsheet and it just looks really bad. Um, with Logic or um, we we invest a bit in um, HubSpot, right? It puts all of your metrics in really nice like graphical representations of what your stuff is so you can very easily look at it if you're not a spreadsheet type of person and it pulls everything automatically and so the marketing metrics for like barbell shrugged are not very confusing at all because they're just there right um if you're pulling from like aweber and google analytics and all this i could definitely see how it would be overwhelming so i would say like get your crms in check you know you might want to invest in something that's a little bit more comprehensive and fun to use and that'll make analytics a lot more fun too yeah there's one thing to track it there's another thing to display it Mm -hmm. so i shouldn't be tracking anything I want it. I want it displayed to me, and I go, "Oh, it makes sense." I think. I think a lot of business owners feel that way, though. They have a hard time with like the tracking piece. They just want like to just give me the numbers I need to see. And in which case, like in, in before we had a lot of the tools that we have today, like a lot of the fancier you know ways to display this stuff or or aggregate it. I hired someone who was just a spreadsheet ninja and just said, hey, here's all of the information I have coming at me. Here's what I need to see. Can you please help me organize this and make this really nice? And they sat down for like three hours. I paid her a few hundred bucks and she made me this beautiful spreadsheet that I used. And just she's like, plug this number here, this number here, this number here, click and you're done. And it was... That was a that was a great place to start. It wasn't the most beautiful way, but she turned them into graphs and everything where I could go and say, oh, look, there it is. It's green. That's good. Yeah. Next, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ideally, you have some type of a graph that, you know, uh, I, we like to use three-week rolling averages or three-month rolling averages. That way, you don't have a graph that's up and down and up and down. It'll, it'll smooth it out so you can easily see the trend. And then if you can have that trend compared to whatever you consider to be your, your standard. So if, uh, if your standard is five members 
per month that you want, there's a big red line across five, and then you can see like the, the three-week rolling average, or sorry, in this case, three-month rolling average that's either above or below the line. That way, when you're displaying it to your team, they can easily see, oh, okay, we're doing good or we're not doing good because the, the, the rolling average is above or below whatever we consider to be the standard. So we covered business metrics. Do you guys have any like personal metrics that you um, will track, like I don't know, sleep or days you train, just stuff to make sure that track your everything. body is everything. Nice. <laughs> and You're asking the wrong people, and we're not going to give you two, three <laughs> answers. <either. clears throat> uh, yeah, I track everything: supplements, sleep, meditation. Yeah. <laughs> That's all Great. I do. All right. <laughs> Next question. Days I worked out, surfed. Yeah. Mm. All right, so we have we have a question. <laughs> I don't like your question, Jessica. Uh, apparently. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so we have uh, from uh, Joseph McGowan. What's up, dude? Um, it says fellow Barbell Logic member here. Is this what is your opinion on merging local gyms under one brand and having the same business system at each location? I think that's the essence of replication: is that you figure out how to get it right at your first location systemize the crap out of it to the point to where it is a repeatable, measurable thing. And you say, great, I'm going to now leverage that into my other location so that they get the advantage of all the work I put into location one. That's really the only way that you're going to benefit from doing that. Because if you don't use one kind of system and approach, each one will have its nuances. You can tweak and tune the details per location. Maybe the demographics a little bit different. The staff's a little bit different. Vibes a little different. But ultimately, you want to bring as much of that into the other locations as possible, in my opinion. Yeah, Joseph, I'm, I'm curious if you could uh, comment on here, uh, if you could let us know. Are you considering merging with another gym with different ownership, or are you looking to replicate what you have? Because I've, I've found that merging can be extremely difficult for a lot of gym owners. And, and how is that structure going to look? Uh, have you experienced much of that, Marcus? I, I have, yeah. I think... I kind of I haven't been doing the gym thing. Like we weren't running a gym and starting in like 2012, so there weren't that many CrossFit boxes merging at the time. And mm-hmm. now it's, it's happening like crazy. Yeah, there's a there's a lot. It's becoming really popular, and there's it can go really sour really fast because the reason why that gym is probably looking to be merged with or it's open is because they're not doing too great, and they're like, hey, I could use what more yeah. of what you've got. You're doing better than me. But the problem is, is that the the deal isn't structured right to where the person, like that bigger brand, you this person basically needs to work for that brand if that's really going to work because if they're still going to be like running their, doing their own version of it and they're, yeah, but I like doing it this way and I don't like doing it that way, you are inevitably going to start running into issues from where you're butting heads from ownership and that's what I've seen mm-hmm. go really south where they are like, well, let's just team up and do it together but I'm going to still do my thing my way and I'm still going to do my thing my way. That, that, was what I was, that was what I was running through my head is like there's this equal ownership thing happening and that somebody has to be in charge. Yeah, so for sure and yeah. there needs to be someone yeah, kind of determining how, how we're doing what and so Joseph specifically, what I, the example I was giving was that you are buying these gyms. Like in essence, you right. are you own these gyms, and they are just other extensions of your brand. So if you have you know CrossFit ABC, and you have location one location, we have our downtown location, we have our west side location, we have so and so. That's the case where you should it all should be running off of one system. If you are talking about independent ownership, where they're doing their thing, they're doing, but we're all just going to call ourselves one thing, then um, there's a lot more swinging parts. We actually have a uh, Jake from uh, Athletics United, who we're going to be uh, interviewing oh, yeah. here in a few weeks. Um, he's got a, probably the only successful version of that that I've seen so far. Mm-hmm. He's crushing it with that with his partner um, and or partners. But um, they're, they've got a unique spin on it. And I'm actually eager to, to really dive in with him, which we'll do on the show, um, to talk more about exactly how yeah. he's doing it. Excellent. Um, uh, the follow-up question is, if I don't have the capital to buy them, what kind of profit sharing could I use? Mm, well, that's that's going to be tricky. Joseph, uh, call me. There's <laughs> a- <laughs> yeah, there's a, lot of, well, there's a lot of things you could do. There's a lot of options there. Um, you could give them some equity in your facility for, to, in, in exchange uh, for cash uh, but, um, or instead of cash. Uh, Brandon Jones asked newbie here really enjoying the live feed curious on what percentage of box owners you think are running their box as their full-time job as opposed to those who have a different full-time job 
Uh, well, I think that I think that number is is changing rapidly because yeah. where it was really easy previously to get away with kind of part timing your your way of running a box and it was still working well enough and the you know it was easy enough and cheap enough to do so. Um, you're now up against people who this is all they do. This is all they care about. Care about. They are investing everything they've got in it. You are just not going to be able to compete as as fairly with someone who's all in. You yep. know, and so. I see that percentage dropping. I mean, we have, I'd say maybe out of the, the people we work with, it's maybe 10 to 15% of the people who yeah. are still doing something else full-time and this is their part-time thing. And in almost all cases, um, aside from a handful, uh, those people have the intention of leaving that full-time job. That's only a temporary thing to kind of get them over the hump because they maybe just started the business and they needed to keep this thing going for benefits reasons or, or income reasons and so on. But I see very few times where someone's got a whole separate thing going and their gym is crushing it and they're running it from a distance. Yeah. When we opened our box in 07, I remember operating 07, 08, 09, 20, even up to maybe 2011, other box owners found out that Doug and I only did the gym and they were like, how are you doing it? <laughs> like it was, it was incredible. It, there was almost, I remember going to competitions and interacting with people and they were blown away that we weren't working another job. So it's come a really long way. There is a trend towards this is your full-time gig because mm -hmm. back in 08, 09, no, it was nobody's full-time gig. And the only reason we could do it back then is because we were young and dumb. So like, <laughs> we didn't know any better. We were, we were like, we just didn't need the money. Either. We were used to being poor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We knew how to do it. And, uh, we're <laughs> living in the gym and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it, the, the trend is, is the other way around at this point. If someone, if someone has a, if they're trying to run a kick-ass gym and yeah. they got the side job, it's like, what are you doing? You need to get in the gym. Yeah. I, I think that's really the big differentiator. It's like, if you're, if you're trying to build something that's going to crush and make good money and like make a big impact, you're probably not going to be able to do it part-time. But if you're just looking to build something that is, you know, it's a great, it's your local spot. And it's just like, Hey, as long as it pays for itself, and, you know, then, and the people are okay that, that are running it day to day, you can get away with that obviously more easily. But if you're like, Hey, I want to build this like mega gym, that's crazy successful and known for being the best and this and that you're going to have a tougher time going up against the full-time guys that this is all they wake up and do every single day. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is a new book out there <clears throat> called Pivot by Jenny something or other. And it's about how you can transition from your full-time career into a completely different career in a strategic way, but also with the idea that you're going to go it all in. But it, I think it's about, I haven't read it, but I've heard a lot of podcasts with her on this. Mm -hmm. um, it's about shortening that, that period of when you have to have both of those jobs and how you can integrate both of them together to make it more seamless for you. Awesome. Very good. Check out that book. Um, let me see. I here. like this question. What we got? For those boxes using Logic, what is the average amount of new members gained per month through Logic? Well, this is a question I get, I think, literally every single day. And the fact is, is that you can't, we work with gyms of all different shapes and sizes, people who are brand new, people who have four locations, people who have big budgets, people who have no budgets. And when you average it out, the numbers just look insane, which is why I never talk about those numbers to just say, what's the average new members I will get? It depends. Is growth your thing? Is that where you needed the most help? Or are you really good at growth and you suck at retention? Or is it the other way around? Is it that, hey, you know, we're, we're amazing with our service. Our retention is amazing, but I can't sell shit great, then growth is going to be huge for you. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we can't really just give a blanket answer of just like, Hey, what's this average number? Cause it's going to be exactly that just super average. So if you really want to figure out like where, like, what can we do for you? Like what would your numbers potentially look like? Get on the phone with me. We'll talk about your specific situation, where your strengths and weaknesses lie and what, what I see is the opportunities for you. And I can give you an idea of, of what that might actually look like for you based on the information that we have from working with hundreds of boxes in all different markets of all different shapes and sizes. And I want to also add to that, you know, your idea of success can be completely different from someone else's idea of success. Mm -hmm. Like we have people who have 25 coaches on staff and their idea is like, Hey, I want to get to like 800 members. Awesome. That's a completely different business model than the guy I work with in the middle of Oklahoma. Who's like, dude, I'm a one man show. That's my dream is I just want to help people with movement every day. I want no employees and I just want to make a killer living. I want to make eight grand a month you know, and I'll be living fat. That's yeah. a completely different idea. So his growth numbers are going to completely be different.
different from the guy who's adding, you know, 40 new members a month. Yeah, this is a very similar question to someone comes into your gym and they say, you know, well, how, how many pounds of fat does someone lose on average when they join here? Yeah. And you go, exactly well, right. there's 200 people here and some people are trying to lose fat and some people aren't trying to lose fat. Some people just want to feel healthier and move better. And some people, you know, they have, they have joint pain. They want the joint pain to go away. Similar with logic. You know, some people, they straight up, they want to get bigger and they want to grow. Some people, you know, they're just overwhelmed and they don't necessarily want to grow. And they, they just want a, a large chunk of the, the business workload to be taken off of their plate and, and automated. And, and that's, that's a, you know, a totally fine reason to want some, something like this. You don't have to get as big as possible. Like you were saying earlier, you don't have to go to three or 400 members if you don't want to, if you want to stick at a hundred, 150, 200 or whatever your number is, then, you know, that that's a totally noble goal. And so similar to a member that comes into your gym and says, you know, well, how much, how much body fat am I going to lose? If I, if I train here, you go, well, you know, it's kind of up to you. You know, if you, if you follow my advice and all, all of my suggestions on how to, how to eat and how to sleep and, and you come in and you actually do the training the way you're supposed to do the training and you, you show up, you know, between three and six days a week or whatever it is, then you'll, you'll lose as much body fat as you more or less want to. Uh, if you don't show up and you don't take anyone's advice and you don't follow the system, then you're not going to get the results. So it really, it really does depend on how well you follow the system and how well you, you know, put your heart into what's available. You'll get good results. If you show up at a gym and you do the work, you'll get good results. If you don't show up, you have a membership, you can have the logic system and not use it, or you can have a gym membership and not use it and you won't get results. If you have a gym membership and you you use it, then you'll get great results. So it really does depend on you know whether you're actually following the system or not. That you got to log been said in. Better. That couldn't have been said better because yeah. that's that is something that I I explain every single day, and it's mm-hmm. I try to make that comparison. I'm embarrassed I didn't think of that myself. That was perfect. You should be ashamed. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go. <laughs> oh, I dishonored myself. Oh. <laughs> um, and and it's absolutely right because it's you know. You, you you can lead a horse to water, right? So we can give you the best strategy, the best tools, the best everything. And if you don't do the work, then it's not going to work as well. Or if it's not as important to you to do something that is, you know, for us, it's about building a great service business. That's what, that's the underlying theme of everything that we do with logic, with the masterminds, with any of the things that we do is that it's about really building a great business, yeah. not here's the, here's the newest tactic or trend. We have those tools in the toolbox, but we're going to apply the ones that are going to be most appropriate to you. But at the end of the day, you still have to show up and do the work and you still have to stay consistent and call someone back within a couple hours. If that's what we deemed is what you need to be doing. And you're like, yeah, it took, takes me two to three days to get back to someone. I don't know why I'm not converting anybody. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just how that's going to be then. Yeah. What yeah. are that that said, we do have many clients that they are using the system and they and they are trying to grow and they have had they have added dozens upon dozens of clients to their gym with mm-hmm. that system. I, I had a text message I got two, three days or maybe not two, three, maybe it was like a week ago at this point. Um, added sixty new members in January. One mm-hmm. location. One month. One month. First month on logic. Cool. Who was this? Damn. I don't, I'm not going to name any names yet. Oh. I'll, yeah, I'll I, save it. I don't. Yeah. But it's, it is, we get that kind of stuff all the time where if someone really digs in and does the work, it's just like an athlete at your gym. They're like, how did she make that incredible transformation? Mm-hmm. She followed the protocol. We told her how to eat. She, you know, she fixed her, her sleep routine. She lowered the stress in her life. She shows up six days a week and she does her homework. Period. Boom. And yeah. it happens, you know, and it's same thing for us because what you have to understand about logic is that Logic is not a silver bullet. It's not a shortcut. It is just a combination of the most high leverage things for an affiliate owner to get the best results possible based on what they want. Combination of business coaching mixed with the website, mixed with the infusion soft and the automation. So you get the right strategy, you get all the right visual tools so everyone so you look the part and you have all the systems in place to make sure your best case scenario happens automatically every single time so that you have the time, energy, and bandwidth to invest your personal touches in the relationship building and managing process, period. Yeah, the difference between showing up to a gym and having no idea what to do and kind of just fumbling around and not really trying that hard and the difference between actually showing up to a CrossFit gym, having a coach there to guide you and provide you with high-quality programming and Mm -hmm. to make sure that you work as hard as you need to work to lose weight is, is phenomenally different. So very similar with Logic. It's a good system. You do have to put in some work, but it that level of guidance and automation is, is a world apart from just having no idea what to do with your marketing. Mm-hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Boom. Bang ring. All right. I think we got time for one, one, maybe two more. Um, let's go ahead and pick one out here. Jess, you want to see what we got? Do you want to, I can answer this one here. Which um, one? how, how do you guys recommend approaching other small businesses to partner with them or should we just market to them? Um, so I, 
I don't know if it was part of this Facebook Live, but we were just recording something right now. So I'm creating a community up in Ottawa. Um, it's not in the fitness space, but it's a co-working space. And we're not united in fitness. We're united in uh, productivity and um, like personal success. And something that we're experimenting with in another company here, Experience Tribe, which you can check them out at experiencetribe.com, are these share economy cards. And so for all of our members, they get a little card and I've gone out to local businesses that I like and that my members would like. So for entrepreneurs, you know, reaching out to um, financial advisors or healthy places to eat around town, um, pe places that they're already frequenting and going to these business owners and saying, you know, I'm expecting to have this many more members that fit this profile. They're already coming to your business. They're not going to your business right now. Would you be interested in offering, you know, 10% discount for my members? And these businesses are typically running deals anyway. And so they've built it into their, um, into their margin to offer for some sort of discount at various times of the year. And I've had really, really great response from that. So now when I'm selling my memberships for my coworking space, I can say, not only do you get this amazing place and we have like weekly or monthly meetups and stuff, but you also get 10% um, discount to all these businesses that other people in our community really like going to. And so it's kind of like revitalizing our local economy and like sharing the love and also creating really cool partnerships with other businesses that I really like in the area. Awesome. Great answer. I like that. Uh, how do you guys, anyone else want to comment on that? Mm -hmm. I think that was great. No, that, that was, was it. Great. Yeah, it was, it was this part of the same feed. So that was okay, it, cool. the beginning yeah. of this whole thing. Um, so, uh, this one's from Instagram. How do you guys handle how much is it question? I understand some people are, are only focused on price and there's nothing to change that. But how do you guys talk about the value of the product? Well, I think this is, um, it's a common issue because of the process most people have for their their sales and, and their initial interactions with people to begin with. If you're not setting yourself up to sit down with someone, get to know them, what have they done in the past, what are they currently doing, what do they like about it, where are they looking to go, and then you really get to know them, build rapport and all that, you're going to get that how much is it question because you're just a commodity. If you just have your prices on your site and it's like click here, sign up, buy this, you're, you are just putting yourself into the category of shop me for price versus making it about them personally and trying to connect. Now, when you do just get the, well, just tell me how much it is, I would usually give a range. I'd say, hey, we actually have a variety of different programs because what we do here is really just based on what's going to get you the best result. You could be paying as low as, you know, 75 bucks a month up to a thousand bucks a month if you want to work with a personal trainer every day. Mm -hmm. It totally depends on what you're going to need. And that's the whole point of us sitting down, getting to know you, seeing you move, talking about what your goals are and really getting to the point of what's important to you. And then I can give you an exact number. So if you're interested in learning more, come on in. And if not, that's the end of the conversation. I think it's really nice to have some type of higher end service like personal training that, you know, costs a thousand dollars a month or however much you want to charge for personal training. That way you can say, well, if you want one on one training, it's a thousand bucks a month. But if you want group coaching, Mm -hmm. then it's 200 bucks a month. And that way you don't talk about gym memberships. You might even, might even very specifically say, and, that, and we don't actually sell gym memberships. Those aren't available. All we offer is coaching. Right. Mm -hmm. That way, and Mike, Mike brought this up the other day, which I thought was a really good point. Like to, to point out and emphasize that you're not selling gym memberships, it makes it where they don't compare you to $9 a month Planet Fitness or, or whatever's down the street. You know, you can get a gym membership for $10, $20, $30 a month pretty easy these days. And so mm -hmm. if your gym membership is 200 bucks a month, and Planet Fitness's gym membership is nine bucks a month, and, and their facility is ten times bigger, and they got pools and saunas and and a smoothie bar and all this other cool stuff. And it looks like those guys are super pro, and you have a rundown warehouse that's all dusty. <laughs> then why are you two hundred bucks a month, mm -hmm. and, and they're nine dollars a month? That sounds ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. So, to point out that you don't offer gym memberships at all, all you offer is coaching, and your group coaching for two hundred bucks a month is only the price of two personal training sessions at the other gym. Makes you sound like, oh, well, that's quite a deal. Mm -hmm. So it's all about how you frame it in that in that Fully. context. Yeah, I mean, yeah. two hundred bucks a month. If I if I go buy coaching for anything, mm -hmm. and I were get were to get, oh, I'm going to get three sessions, three one hour sessions per week. I'm only going to pay 200 bucks a month. That's an incredible deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, trying to compare to like the shiny objects in the other place. That's a yeah. tough sell. Yeah. It, it's very hard to know what something is worth. Just, just straight up. Like if, if, if someone brings out a brand new service, you say, what's this worth? You go, I don't know. It, you can only really know what something's worth and if it's a good deal or not when you have something to compare it to. Right. It's all about context, context and comparison. So if it's just this number that's, you know, like if someone says, you know, if you don't know anything about electronics and you say like, you know, I'll say this for $50 and they go, okay. And 
What's it? They have, they have no idea. They have no idea. Like even if they know what it does, they don't know if fifty dollars is a good price for that thing. You know, if they go on Amazon, all they're gonna do is they're gonna look that thing up and they're gonna see what how, how much the other ones cost. Mm-hmm. They go, oh, the other ones are worth four hundred dollars. Fifty dollars is now a good price. And if they look and they say, oh, well, everyone else on Amazon is selling these for twenty dollars. Fifty dollars is a total ripoff. It's all once they find out what what other similar things are worth, then they know if it's a good price or not. So yep. comparing your gym membership your membership to another $9 gym memberships makes, makes you look expensive. If you don't sell memberships and now you're selling coaching compared to other coaching, that's a thousand bucks a month. Now you're cheap. So yeah. you got, you got to have the right thing to compare it to. Yep. Boom. Beautiful. How many minutes are we in? 45. We can do another one. What's the best way to pick supplements to offer your members outside of ingredients? What's something that you'd take? Yep. There you go. Is, is it, would you take it? Would, you know, would you take it? Can you personally stand behind it? And then, is it worth it for you from a margin standpoint to stock? And if you're then choosing like, well, which one, if there's a couple that all kind of look the same in that regard, choose who you think is going to help you best sell this stuff. There's different, you know, different size supplement companies and people who are just, you know, they just say, Hey, here's, here's the product. Good luck. Pat on the ass and go sell it and let us know when you want to reorder. And there's companies that are going to actually work with you on helping you actually try to move the product and position it correctly. And Hey, here's some ideas and other affiliates that we've worked with. This is what they do. Um, that can make a massive difference in how well it works. So I'd say, can you, would you take it yourself? Is the margin worth it for you? And then as the kind of the wild card is like, Hey, and could you potentially help me sell this stuff? Yeah. I think uh, if you had a, a product page on your website and you created a Google affiliate link, you wouldn't even have to stock your gym with any any actual product. You could just send people to your product page and then they click on the little like affiliate link, right? And then you get a kickback on whatever you're selling. Yeah, Does that but make we, sense? Yeah, you can, you can do that. And, and the larger boxes can do that because then they don't want to stock, you know, 10, 15 grand worth of product. But I've seen a huge difference in like when the impulse buy. It's when they're right there and they're like, oh, that's right. I need another bag of protein. You will literally sell double as many oftentimes. So worth it to stock and to have them available and pretty. And if the margin is there for sure, just make sure that you have, you have a process to it. A lot of people get into retail and they don't understand, you know, the idea of shrinkage and like, Hey, if you know, your coaches each, you know, walk away with one bag or they're like, Oh, I just get one as as an employee. Right. And you give away five, six bags out of your small order. There went your entire margin. And now you're literally selling supplements for free. So Make sure that you have the processes in place to manage your inventory and, hey, how many do we have to sell to get what we want? And so how are we going to position this? Are we introducing it to our, our audience? Like, is it going to be mentioned in our on-ramp program and we giving samples? And like, there's all sorts of cool tricks you can do to like really get people on the stuff, to, to get people like introduced to it at the right time in the right context so that they say, oh, that totally applies to me and this is pretty good. And you're like, yeah, and that's what I take too. You're the authority. You're the person they're looking at going, oh, well, if you take it and well, make sure you look, look at you. First. Well, yeah, don't be, don't be a schlub. <laughs> I was just assumed. <laughs> <laughs> look at us. Come, come on, look at this. I, and <laughs> I'm a big fan of getting supplements that have opiates in them. <laughs> opiates? I'm not sure that qualifies as a supplement <laughs> and, and, anymore. And addictive qualities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Something that's going to run you into the floor. <laughs> Short term. They can't long-term. get enough. They yeah, have to keep perfect. coming back for more. You, they don't even work out anymore. They I, just come and buy your, your opiate filled supplement. The margins are insane on that stuff. Huge. Though. If we get the opiate testosterone <laughs> blend, it just, it just works so well. Feel good, but get jacked. You can't stop taking it. You just get bigger and bigger. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. You're welcome, everybody. Uh, Sell <laughs> pro- supplements. Cool. Uh, um, I think we can uh, wrap it up. What do you guys think? Uh, Storm's coming. We got to hunker down. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to, you know, whatever. <laughs> Shut down the, win- the window. Uh, your, your palm trees put are Put the boards up. <laughs> the, I'm waiting for one of these trees to come crashing through here for sure. Yeah. Actually, I do want to address this one more question. Okay, go for it. If I am not the ge- – because I've seen this question like three times this week from different mm. people. I'm assuming right. it's a different person. Maybe it's the same person with different names out there. On it. Just to, he's with so me. determined. I'm going to get this question answered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I am not the gym owner, but trying to become the uh, the gym's first employee, manager slash head coach, how would you guys handle this situation? The gym does not have a marketing strategy, systems, etc. I am trying to take on those responsibilities and help make the gym sustainable and hopefully grow. They have not been used in the past, but because the owner never planned on making money but it has decreased the value we can bring to our clients. Any insight would be much appreciated. Thanks again, guys. I want to take this question because we do have people who are coaches that are not gym owners that get frustrated. They, they see where the gym could be doing better. Uh, maybe 
the gym owner's been running the place for years and years and years, and it's just not as interested as it used to be. And there's just this, and then there's this desire. I, I had someone else reach out to me earlier this week where they, um, the gym owner was going to shut down the gym that month. And there was this community there and the co- there was people coaching part time. They were like, but we want to keep this thing going. Mm-hmm. And the truth is, is if the gym owner is not committed to growth and making it happen, it's just, it won't happen. You need a leader who is, is in there and, and doing the work. Um, I, I would, if the gym owner was never interested in making money and you want to be able to make money as a coach and so on and so forth, I would probably, I would suggest starting a conversation where you can purchase the gym or if it's a type of gym where it's not making money and they never plan on making money, they probably don't do contracts, which means the gym is worth about however much the equipment is worth and so on and so forth. So I would start looking at trying to become an owner yourself and if you're somebody who's like, I really like this, but I don't want to be an owner, you just need to find somebody who's an owner that's really passionate about growing their gym. Yeah, or else and it's going to be an uphill battle forever. You're going to yeah. come in there and be the hero by, hey, well, I'll just start doing this and this, and it starts getting better. But if they're not committed to it, they're not bought in, then you know, you're just going to start doing more and more and more with really, you know, you're know, you not going to make any money. There's not really money there to for them to pay you much, if anything. So, I mean, if it's a, if it's just a passion project and you just are looking to kind of like cut your teeth on, on coaching and, and you want to contribute and have this be a learning experience to maybe open your own down the road or something like that, you know, you can just start providing value and just saying, hey, I see these things aren't happening. Here's how I'd want to do them. Here, here's what I think it would take to do it. Can we make a deal? Make the deal. If they're up for it, great. But make sure you're managing your own expectations, right? And if the person is then, you know, if it is someone who's super passionate and you think that there's potential with it, then now you could really go create a job. So let's assume the person is on top of it and they're doing, they're doing well. In that case, I, I always come from a place of seeing where, where is there a place where I can provide a lot of value that's not being delivered on in correctly or adequately or not at all maybe. And I can then go and I make a deal say, Hey, can I, let me help you with this stuff. This is kind of what I do. And I just start helping. I have always, that's how I got a lot of my first or my best jobs and my best raises or things when I was an employee would be, I would just see the opportunity and just start fixing problems and just starting to do it. But managing that person's expectations being like, I'm going to do this. And when I get to this number, let's have a conversation. Okay. Yep. And then they're like, Oh, okay. And then you're like, cool. I just raised your revenue by 10 grand a month. Now it's time for us to have that conversation. Yeah. Don't be a martyr. Yeah. If you ever start feeling like a martyr, get the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So strong, like, is that yeah, a strong closing yeah. note? <laughs> yeah, do that. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know. Ben Chu, he was he got in late. Well, Yay, Ben. One more. Hi, Ben. I'm a sucker for questions, guys. God, we were trying to be done like 15 minutes ago. Man. I know. Sorry. Any thoughts on... I'm always looking for and This is value. because we like Ben. <laughs> I like Ben. Any thoughts on working with healthcare providers? We are looking at offering direct healthcare from an... I don't even know what this is. From an FNP and DC... I guess that would be a Cairo FNP. I don't know what FNP is. As either an add-on or increasing the base cost of membership. Oh, they're talking about adding. Man, maybe I shouldn't have taken this question. <laughs> wait, wait, <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> you should have, should have read it before we uh, before we look to answer it. That's yeah, why, that's, I, this is why we have Google. I want I want to say he's asking about physical therapy, Cairo, <sighs> things like that. So. Things that would nurse be nurse practitioner. Yeah, nurse practitioner. Functional nurse practitioner. Yeah. Family nurse practitioner. Family yeah, nurse so practitioner. things that you might normally find in a medical center, adding that into the facility. Um, and that way, I'm assuming that way, being able to work with insurance companies and things like that. Um, who who does, uh, there's a couple people that do that. They've tied in medical practices with gyms and things like that. Um, Jeremy Draper has done it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, WellFit. WellFit. Mm-hmm. Um, you probably just Google WellFit and check out his website and kind of see how he operates. Yeah, I um, might want to check that out. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure, so I'm not. I'm not real big into that that model. I I really haven't seen that like firsthand ever. Beyond like I've seen a lot of of Kairos, physical therapists, but never like a a, a nurse practitioner or or like a doctor providing like real true healthcare services. Yeah. And I haven't seen it tied into membership and stuff before. Mm -hmm. So I know that there's a, there's a Cairo where, where I train uh, Michael Stromsness over at physical culture and you know, he has his office in the back, but his services are completely separate from the gym membership and whatnot. So 
Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry. <laughs> if <laughs> I obviously don't know much about this either, but I do know that Stave Off CrossFit, um, mm-hmm. Christina and what's her husband's name? Darn. Anywho, uh, they're a Canadian. <laughs> You're CrossFit starting to box. sound Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> Darn. Anywho. <laughs> Anywho. Um, <laughs> so they, they, their branding is it feels very uh, medical and like clinical and still really fun. So um, Ben, if you're looking for ways to brand your your CrossFit box in a way that um, may attract those sites those types of things i would suggest going to their site they create like the greatest videos i think they go on like local television and they do a bunch of bunch of interviews and things um yeah stave off s-t-a-v-e mm, it's nick and christina nick yeah that's right mm-hmm. awesome yeah check All them right. out they're doing let's wrap job. this up Dun, 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 dun. Awesome. We're done. Oh. And we answered all the questions except for that one. You know who you were. <laughs> <laughs> Ask a better one next time. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. Well, um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. This was a lot of fun. We'll be doing these from time to time. Um, I think we'll probably have another one coming up in maybe a couple months. So uh, make sure you stay tuned in, follow along, and we'll have a, a kick-ass show for you next week uh, that will be rolling out. Yes. Pew.